Hey guys, Brent Holt Build Show, talking today about an historic room. We've been hired to remove an historic room, but there's parts and pieces that are historic and parts and pieces that aren't. How do you tell the difference? I'm gonna show you how to dig in the parts and pieces that change over time today in the Build Show. Okay, we're in an historic room. We've been hired to dismantle this historic room, put it into storage for them, and when they move to a new location, we're gonna reinstall it. Now, we come in here and me as the historic geek look at it and go, oh great, great historic room. Look at these wonderful details, fluting on this column, this wonderful carving here, and all these moldings and parts and pieces that are so awesome, right? But there are some things here that are a little bit hard to figure out. For instance, this is one of the grates that go over the air conditioning and it's made of plaster. Hmm, wonder what that's about. We'll figure it out. As you go down here, there's wonderful carvings. There's these arches in the ceiling and there's a uh, wonderful detail in here, the molding, the scale. It's all quarter sawn white oak, right? We see back here in this paneling and this detail in this beveled glass, the way this door is made, the wood stop in there. It's an historic way of building. There's some awesome details in here and it's a beautiful room but there are pieces and parts in here that are not original. How do you know? So what's the deal with historic rooms, right? Why would someone gather this and, and reinstall it like this? In fact, historically, there's been incredible business about moving rooms. There's this great book called Moving Rooms, all about the history of how historic rooms were taken from great places and moved to other places. If you've read my book, Traditional American Rooms, you know that Winter Tour, Henry DuPont's home, which he turned into a museum, is filled with historic rooms, right? From 1640 to 1860, he's got, you know, taverns from New Hampshire and beautiful houses from Philadelphia, high style, low style from all over the different colonies, all rooms, right, moved to his house. Now, the historic room like this is essentially, you have things that were happening in England and in other places. The building styles were different, the building traditions were different, the level of craftsmanship was higher, right? And so you see this, this carved paneling. Now that's called strap work carving, okay? And you see a little bit right here in, in this piece here and here, right? That's a typical English carving that you'd see in English styles. And look at, look at the back of the panel of this cabinet, right, that you don't really have a big piece of plywood here, okay, because plywood's something that happens after 1950s, 60s, 70s, right? But they've actually made this up of these, of these separate panels because you didn't have big sheets of plywood. So historically, cabinets, when they were made like this, weren't made from sheets of plywood, they were made from boards, right? And so you have these individual pieces and boards that were, you know, would make up the back of a cabinet. Now, when they moved this room, they did a number of things here that are clues to how, how the room originally was. I'm gonna show you some of those. One, you see this fireplace insert, right? That inside this fireplace, you see these, these applied moldings here, a big panel here. Now, how do we know that this isn't original? Well. This is one cheap big piece of plywood, right? We're just talking about how historically they didn't really have plywood at that period, so they made it up of these style and rail panels, right? In this case, we just have a big sheet of plywood and an applied molding, okay? So probably 1970s, 1980s, they would have done this. And look at this, uh, the, the, the way this piece of plywood is made. There, there are a number of different ways to apply that final veneer of plywood. They would take the log and they would peel the whole piece off. And so it's called a rotary cut, right? And so you actually have this applied panel here. And then when we look at the width of this column here, and the, the crazy grain in here, we know it's new. If we go back to the inside of this cabinet, right, this is all vertical and quarter sawn oak, okay? And so really high quality wood, right? Over here we get into plain sawn oak and we get into a much different element. So the first thing is, is look for plywood, right? Plywood will tell you that was made at a later period of time because really good plywood, 50s, 60s, 70s is when that whole industry starts as far as buying a sheet of plywood, making cabinets from it and things like that. Maybe the 40s is the kind of the earlier period. So we know that, that looking at this room, it's certainly not from the you know 1940s. It was probably salvaged from the building around the turn of the century, around 19 this piece is an add-on. 
Now the second piece to focus on is, is kind of the scale of everything, right? If you look at the way this, this is broken up, we have these small little volumes broken up by these arches that go over top here. Now, this obviously is a really large volume here, and you can see the same thing too with moldings. Look at this crown molding. Okay, this crown molding is made up of one, two, three, four parts, right? That four part crown there is, makes up this section. Look what happens as we move back into here. One piece of crown, right? And so historically, you don't have these big, you know, four inch wide crown moldings in historic millwork, right? You would have a crown broken up much more like this than by a single, a single molding. So what's happening is the scale of the moldings is changing. And as, as we look at the details of how this room is put together, you're gonna see where moldings change and moldings alter, okay? The other place you see that thing is right down here, okay? In that you have these, these smaller moldings that make up this base and then this big kind of clunky thing and a clunky thing at the bottom. What I think has happened in here is they've actually lifted this room up about 16 inches, okay? And that these are, and you'll see them over there, are actually plaster. What they were trying to do is they were trying to get air conditioning into this room, right? They didn't want to cut vents, so they lifted the whole room up, probably for the scale and the size of the room as well, because if I measure from this point to the, to the top, it's only about nine feet, right? And so by adding this 16 inches, they're able to kind of gain a little bit of height here. But you'll notice that these moldings have changed and the scale of them has changed. And this was my clue to kind of start looking at this thing, kind of figuring out what had happened here and why this had changed. But the scale of moldings gives me the clue that this has changed. The third way of kind of figuring out when something was built is by looking behind the walls and looking at the fasteners. When I was in North Bennett Street, we would date something, right, based on the saw, saw marks on the back of a piece of wood, whether it was pit sawn, whether it was made in a sawmill, or whether it was circular sawn. And those things would tell us, you know, when the circular saw is, you know, 1830s, 1850s, somewhere in that range, that we would be able to date the wood based on the markings, right? Same thing is true with nails. You you know, the wire nail, okay, didn't really come around. A round nail didn't really start until about the 1890s, right? And so if you see a square cut nail, right, you know that it's pre-1890s roughly. And then there's the hand wrought nail, which is kind of a handmade nail, okay? So industrialization started the cut nail, 1820s. It ends around 1890s. And then wrought nails or handmade nails are made before that. Everything dates itself is an idea that we learned in North Bend Street. Conversation pits, shag carpets, smoked mirrors right all those crazy different things hand scraped floors of today you know glazings all those things date themselves and tell us when they were made now in this case we've got three different types of fasteners here if I look down here I've got a drywall screw right obviously a drywall screw wasn't available in the 1900s early 1900s so we know that this is not original look at this here I've got a wire nail with no head on it, okay? What that means is a nail gun. A nail gun shot that into there, right? And so I know that this is probably from the, you know, 1990s and forward, that drywall screw about the same period, right? The, when drywall screws started to be used like that. And then back here, if you look right here on the back of this panel, what do I see? I see a slotted screw right there. That slotted screw is something that, right? You don't start having Phillips head screws in-house is being used on hardware and other things like that until you know in the last 20 or 30 years and so most things were slotted screws and if you've been doing it as long as i have you know the frustration of slotted screws and why they've come up with star bits and all the other types of fasteners in a screw head because a slot head is a terrible screw to be able to use but that was what was most popular at the turn of the century right and during that time when they have the manufactured screws and that's why we know that this part at least is probably original to that time the last thing is is the gentle fakery that happens on an historic room what's original what isn't now there are clues and shadow lines of what the past really held Here's a good one, right? That there, see the dark stain versus the light stain here? And see this little, there's something missing here, right? The, the moldings have stopped. There is a bracket in here that supported both these sides. So you start looking closer. This panel looked a little bit funny, and then I saw this hardware up here, okay? Or this old line where the hardware was. And if we look down here at the bottom, we can also see a pivot hinge, right? And so there was what's called a jib door in here that opened and closed across this opening that would snap and shut here, and we can see the hardware for it out here. 
Look at this leaded glass window that we think is original, right? But this one pane of glass down here is a little bit lighter in color than the other one. So most likely it was broken. They did a really good job of kind of fixing it. They didn't quite get the color of the glass right, but the painting and everything else in there is really nice. And so there are uh, clues to the past right here that are fun things that make you wonder, and we may never know what was really here, right? What parts have been taken away that we really don't understand and know, yet there's clues to the past here. Another one that they really did that was really interesting is, is this molding here. And this goes around one of the brackets at the top, and you can actually see the chisel marks in this egg, okay? So this is an egg and dart profile. And looking on the corner, you can actually see where the miter comes together, right? The only problem with it is this is all plaster, okay? So what they did was they took a mold of the original one, and so we actually have the lines of the oak in there and even the miter joint, okay, showing up in this piece of fakery, right? And so as we take apart this room, we're gonna find out even more stuff. Look at this shelf, right? This little bead detail, that's something that we don't do anymore, right? Typically you would see a big piece of plywood and then a face frame on top of it but this is an historic shelf. We know this is original. This comes from that original cabinet. So all kinds of clues and things in here that are fun. I could spend the next two days, right? Looking at this, trying to figure out where, the, where these different parts and pieces come from, but all tell us about the past and are all wonderful clues. Okay guys, a couple things as we leave this video, right? One, notice that we are sleuthing and figuring out when this was built by looking behind the walls, right? What are you leaving behind the walls, right? They're gonna tell people about, you know, how you did things in the past. Notice too, how the scale of, of time has changed, right? That I can look at that historic crown made up of four parts and then the newer crown made up of one part, right? that there is more work going into these historic things. The one reason why they're more beautiful is because it wasn't quick and easy. It was made up of a bunch of different parts and they were very careful to work on the scale and proportion so that it looks right. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Home Millwork, Whole Homes, a lot of behind the scenes things that we're doing, figuring out how to build better. I'm Brent Hall, thanks for watching.